Happy Sabbath, everyone. Sabbath. Thanks, Brother Ron. Mm. So, uh, back in what, 1988 or 89, author Stephen Covey came out with a book called The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. A lot of businesses use it. They continue to use it. It's been edited and uh, retaining most of its, uh, its originality throughout. And the purpose um, was to make them more productive and get along at work with others. Right? So again, more profits and all that type of stuff. We're not talking about that today. Okay? This isn't a uh, self-help situation. Okay? Um, Covey, though, was, um, was a Mormon, a dedicated Mormon. Um, and uh, we're not going to talk about that either. <laughs> but what he did was he, he, a lot of the principles that he wrote about in this book and his other books were biblically based, but in my opinion, they denied the power thereof. They had a form of godliness and denied the power thereof. If you've ever watched the movie Time Changer, um, there's a couple by that name. Um, but it's the one with uh, Meryl, uh, Captain Steubing, uh, Gavin McLeod in it, right? Um, but uh, the same thing. You can't put forth the teachings of Christ without the authority of Christ behind it. Um, so a lot of the self-help type books like uh, Seven Habits of Highly Effective People rely much on dependence on oneself. And the Bible contrasts that with our sufficiency in Christ, Right? The spirit's willing, but the flesh is weak. So these books often fail um, to deal with the root of the problem. But we're going to follow along the format, this, just the main key formats of the habits that Covey wrote, but we're going to do it from a biblical basis using Scripture. And there's lots of different ways you can dice this, but I'm hoping this will be edifying for you. Yes, sir. So change starts from within, most people say, right? But I would challenge you to think that it also starts from without in our, con our, our concern, as it comes from God, right? But as believers make their decision to improve their relationship th with God through the things they can influence, rather than just reacting to external forces, that relationship gets better. Psalm 19, verse 7, the law of the Lord is perfect. We just sang about this, right? Converting the soul, the testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple, right? So to be proactive, we have to use our resourcefulness and initiative, or we'll call it our R and I, and we have several resources at our disposal. But first, let me ask, what does it mean to be an effective believer? Anybody? Glorify our Heavenly Father. Amen to that. What else you got? That's great. And that's exactly it. All right? Be conformed to the image of Christ. How about that? Right? Good. Okay. And there's lots of things along those lines that you could think of. Uh, bearing the fruit, all the fruit of the Spirit, all the time. Right? That's how you know that you're being effective. Right? It's not knowledge-based. So are you an effective believer? Sometimes, all the time, anytime you are, it's by his grace. Yes? Well, let's look at some of the resources that we have at our disposal. Of course, first we have the Word. The Word of God is very powerful and is good for us. Let's uh, read Joshua starting uh, chapter 1, verse 7. Only be thou strong and very courageous, that thou may observe to do all according to, according to all the law which my Moses, my servant, commanded you. Turn not from it to the right hand or to the left, that you may prosper whithersoever you goest. This book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but you shall meditate therein day and night, that you may observe to do all, according to all that is written therein. For then thou shalt make thy wife prosperous, and then you shall have good success. Have I not commanded thee? 
Be strong and of good courage. Be not afraid, neither thou be dismayed, for the Lord thy God is with thee whithersoever you goest. That's the real prosperity gospel. Right? Observe what he says to do. He's our Father. He gives us good gifts. And then your way shall be prosperous. Now that doesn't mean physically prosperous. It, it may include that, but it may not. Good success. Good success at what? They weren't working in the office buildings back then, right? Good success at living a godly life and at peace with all men. Amen. Amen. So Psalm 1, verses 1 and 2, which is also the first song in your hymnal, says, Blessed is the man that is walking not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standing in the way of sinners, nor sitting in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law he does meditate day and night. That's one of the resources we have, is to think about the Word. And you don't always have to have the Scripture on you and reading it. The, many of our forefathers who went before us didn't have a Bible. You know, They maybe heard a scroll in a synagogue or uh, so forth, Told, heard stories from you know, their, their godly parents, and they remembered the Scripture and what it meant and they applied it to their lives. And that's what we can do as well. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 14 through 17 says, But continue you in the things which you have learned and have been assured of, knowing whom you have learned them, and that from a child you have known the holy scriptures, which are able to make you wise unto salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. <coughs> All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. So at our resource, at our disposal is a resource when you have the God's Spirit to go with it. The Word alone isn't going to prosper, right? Satan used the Word and it didn't prosper him, right? He used it falsely. When you have the Spirit and the Word, it is able to furnish you completely so you may do all good works. And that's something, if you can hang on to that, that can help you in your walk. God is not, uh, does not um, take His Word lightly, and neither should we. On into Acts 17... We read about the famed Bereans, right? Uh, let's uh, pick that up in verse 10. The brethren immediately sent away Paul and Silas by night unto Berea, who coming thither went into the synagogue of the Jews. These were more noble than those in Thessalonica in that they received the word of God with all readiness of mind and searched the scriptures daily whether those things were so. Therefore many of them believed, and also of honorable women which were Greeks and of men not a few. So and this is the way we should always read the scripture, with a readiness of mind, a readiness to believe, but then you always have to temper that with searching the scriptures to make sure of what it is that you're being told or taught. So always do that, and we have an, that's an honor, I believe, that we have. We have multiple Bibles in, in this house, right? electronic versions on your phones and, and lots of paper versions in uh, your hands in your purses and backpacks and in the bookcases here, right? And I'm sure that many Christian homes are that same way. They don't do any good sitting on the shelf or in your bag, right? Um, but they do when you hide that word in your heart. So, and it's not really how often you read. I mean, very, you know, I, I commend those who stick to a, you know, a, a Bible, a daily Bible reading schedule. Okay, God doesn't require that of you. Okay, but it's good if you want to do that, and that's that's your offering. That's how it feeds you. But He does require us to think about Him and think about His law and think about the things of God all the time, and that should be what we do. Now, you could take one little verse and you could think about that verse all day, and there's enough meat on there to last you throughout the day, and probably have enough left over for twelve baskets. Right? So. This is a great blessing. Let's not take it lightly. When, since we do have it, let's, let's use it and encourage one another to use it. Don't, 
don't judge one another by how much or how little they can they read or understand, but let's all work together as one body. And we'll talk about that a little bit later too, about working uh, in in concert with one another. The second resource we have is prayer. Isaiah 56, 7 says, Even them will I bring to my holy mountain and make them joyful in my house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and their sacrifices shall be accepted upon mine altar, for mine house shall be called a house of prayer for all people. That first line, joyful in my house of prayer. Do you find joy in praying? Sometimes... Do you feel you're doing it just out of necessity? Well, I know I'm supposed to, so I'm going to. God can even cure that in your heart. It should be that we long to hear His voice and that we long to bring all of our concerns before Him. Does He know them? Yes, absolutely, He knows them. But that didn't stop our, our forebears from pouring out their hearts before Him. Husband and wife, you can know how each other feel, but unless you talk about it, you're not going to have that same intimacy and concern for one another. And God does that for our sake, so that we can pour out our heart to Him and engage in that relationship. So I, again, I think that this is a resource that um, should not be relegated to just prayers before meals and services. Right? Or a want list of things that, oh, God, give me this. Let me have that. Oh, take this away from me so I don't have to deal with this. All those types of prayers. Right? A lot of our prayers should be geared towards thankfulness. Right? For who He is and what He has already called you to. You, you've already won the lottery, so to speak. Right? You got, you got better. You got a crown laid up for, your, for yourself. Right? Psalm 5, verse uh, 1. Give ear to my words, O Lord. Consider my meditation. Hearken to the voice of cry, my King and my God. For unto thee will I pray. My voice shall you hear in the morning, O Lord. In the morning I will direct my prayer unto thee, and I will look up. I think the most important time of day to pray is early in the morning. Jesus would rise up early in the morning and go off and pray. I, I think that's a good example for us. Right? Plus, you set that tone for the rest of the day for that relationship. Right? And it's amazing how, a diff how much of a different outlook your day takes on when you start the day in earnest prayer. Not a, a, a mechanical or rushed through prayer, but an earnest prayer. Right? And as one, another song in our hymnal says, He walks with me and He talks with me. And he, he does through our prayer. But remember, uh, prayer is, is not just speaking. It is listening to the Spirit of God. right? And you know that I emphasize this point uh, quite a bit in Luke 11, that uh, the disciples, although they had the Savior right at their disposal, the best resource that they can you know, ping him for any turn or any knowledge that they wanted. They never said, Lord, teach us to preach the gospel. Lord, teach us to baptize. Lord, teach us. They said, Lord, teach us to pray. That's what they thought was most important to learn from their Savior. And Jesus taught them not only through the model prayer, but he also taught them in his life. What is your life teaching those around you? Parents for your children. Do they see you pray? Do they hear you pray? Do, they, do you talk about prayer and what that's about with your children? Husbands to your wives, especially if they're younger in the faith, right? They might need some of that knowledge. They may not have that understanding. That's so Luke 11, 1 through 4. I'm not going to read that because we talked about it already. That would be effective. <laughs> Ephesians 6.18 says, Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. Praying always, i got to say that early in my discipleship, I had, a, I had a problem with that. I was concerned that I, 
I wasn't praying always, right? And I had uh, asked a, a minister at the time. I had said, you know, I, you know, pray without ceasing, pray always. I'm not doing that. I'm I'm, I'm, I'm sinning. I need I, you know I need to know how to do this. And he assured me that it's to always have that prayer ready on your lips. Right? To always have a prayerful heart and always be ready to engage in that conversation. And to always pray about things rather than worry about them. How many times do we just worry about things and we only pray the big things to God? Right? And then I got it and I understood. Praying always is, it's like breathing always for a Christian. We should always have that purple heart. And for one another, with all perseverance, continuance in prayer, remember the uh, you know, widow before the unjust judge, and supplication for all the saints, praying for one another. Right? And we had some nice praise reports from prayer this morning. That's wonderful. But I think this is, this is a resource, again, that we have to be careful not to underutilize or take for granted. Right? Jesus died so that that veil would be torn in two. And we didn't need that altar of incense, which is the prayers of the saints, to be taken in by a high priest. He tore that veil so we have direct access to the Father. Whatever you ask in my name, I will do, he said. Right? So let's not re, uh, neglect that resource. Again, in Philippians 4, pick it up in verse 4. Rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice. Let your moderation be known to all men. The Lord is at hand. Be careful for nothing, or be anxious for don't be anxious for anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be known to God. And the peace of God, which is passing all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, Whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue, and if there be any praise, think on these things. Those things which you have both learned and received and heard and seen in me, do, and the God of peace shall be with you. That's a lot to take in. Everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Trials do come, as we've heard this morning. Are you thankful for those? Or you just want to escape them? Right? Sometimes God does some of his best work on us in those trials. And Father does know best. And if we're in prayer we will be able to discern through the Spirit what work He's doing, whether it be for us or to enable us to help somebody in the future. Or both. Our God can do that, right? I like that this verse follows up talking about all these good things, these virtuous things, whatever's good, whatever's true, whatever honest. Think on these things. Are you thinking about those things when you're in prayer most of the time? Or do you end up you're thinking all the negative stuff and that's why you're praying? Or this is happening, that's happening, take this away. Just, again, some encouragement to think about those things so you don't be crushed under your discouragement. And no, if you're thinking about the honest and the just and the pure, these are all things of God. And that's where you're going to find all these things that are lovely and full of virtue is in his word and in his saints. Right? So when you're thinking on those things, I think it can help your disposition in prayer. He says that uh, you're going you're to basically prosper in your prayer if you do these things. He says, I do these things. I model in these things. I learned them and received them just as you have learned and received them and heard them. You've seen me do them as well, right? That's so important to model the behavior. We're going to talk about that one too. To, to model the behavior... So you're not a hypocrite when you talk about it. And then uh, we heard from the book of James earlier. We're going to just hit that before we go on to our third resource. 
James 5, verse 14 through 16, Is any sick among you? Let him call the elders of the church, and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith shall save the sick, and the Lord shall raise him up. And if he has committed sins, they shall be forgiven him. Confess your faults one to another, and pray one for another, that you may be healed. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man is availing much. And he goes on to talk about Elijah being a man of like passions as us, and yet his prayers were able to seal the heavens for three years and then ca again cause it to rain when he prayed. That wasn't the power of Elijah, that was the power of God. And it was his faith in God that enabled those things to work. The effectual, highly effective believer, highly effective believer, is that a heb? H-E-B? Eh, eh, anyways. The effectual, effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. I think being righteous is important in this equation, too. Here's the way to be righteous. If you've sinned, repent and accept God's forgiveness. Now you're righteous again. Okay? You're made clean. And now your prayer could be made without any regrets or doubts cast in by the devil. Okay? And then, now repentance, is, as you know, isn't just feeling bad. It's a true 180. And your heart, let God work in your heart on these things. And he will improve that quality of your prayer life. Because again, I believe that all comes from him. And besides the word and prayer, our third uh, important resource is Christians, other believers. I'll admit, there's some good and bad examples in all that. right? And there's also some who claim the title Christian or believer and are really not. The tares do grow among the weeds. Okay? And we're not going to spend some time on that one. Proverbs 27, 17, though, says, Iron sharpens iron, so a man sharpens the countenance of his friend. Again, lots of times uh, I see that used in the Church of God. It's about uh, a Bible argument. Iron sharpens iron. No, this means that. No, this means that. Okay, that's not necessarily what it means. Right? It can, it can kind of include that if your intent of the heart is to improve improve together towards being more godly, more Christ-like. But what it does mean is that we should care for one another. James 5, 19-20, Brethren, if any of you do err from the truth and one convert him, let him know that he that which converts the sinner from the error of his ways shall save a soul from death and hide a multitude of sins. We need other Christians to hold us accountable. Right? If you commit a sin and nobody says anything, I'm telling you that's because they really don't, they really aren't showing you love. I won't say they don't love you, because maybe they're just mistaken in their action. But they're not showing you love. Because if unrepented of, that sin could take you out of the kingdom. So that's really important. And in our non judgmental society, that's becoming a norm in the church, and that shouldn't be. God does not accept sin, and neither should we. Okay? Now, he does accept sinners to bring them to repentance through his love and his grace. Okay? There's a difference. But again, I can show love to a sinner, but if I don't tell him about his need for Jesus Christ through repentance and forgiveness of his sins, am I giving him, I'm not giving him the gospel. I'm giving him an incomplete message. And frankly, I, I could be interfering with what God could do if you would speak that word to them. So don't be, don't be bashful, don't be ashamed of the word of God and the gospel. It's what saved you. You realized you were a sinner and that you needed to because of that, he loved you. You needed to jump on that. And you needed to accept his forgiveness and be washed clean. That's very important. John 1 reminds us that our fellowship with God is also with one another through the Spirit. Verse 6 says, If we say we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. Stop there for a second. 
If you're doing anything that you know you shouldn't be doing that's contrary to God, it says that you're lying and you're not doing the truth and you don't have fellowship with Him no matter what you're thinking. Don't deceive yourself. Sin deceives. Let's get right with God. It's a real short path. Your knees to the ground. That's the short path. Right? So don't be deceived. But if we walk in the light as He is in the light, now we have fellowship one with another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, His Son, cleanses us from all sin. That's how we have the fellowship together. Three really great resources, besides the Holy Spirit, which is contingent on you being a Christian, to even use these resources properly as meant to be. Okay. Of course, God's Spirit is the greatest resource. But with all these resources at our disposal, can you say you're taking the initiative to be an effective believer for his kingdom and a witness? And that's where we get into the habits. Okay? Now, let me preface again. I, I applied these. These are the same precepts that Covey uses, but we're going to just use Scripture for them. This isn't about self-help. This isn't about prospering in your workplace, although I believe if you work like you're working for Jesus Christ, you will prosper to, to whatever degree that is in whatever work you do. If it's sweeping out, up behind the elephants at the zoo, praise, glory to God. Okay? Put the active in proactive. It takes action. Right? James tells us we have to be doers of the word. Let's read that in the third. Starting in verse 21 of chapter 1. Wherefore, lay apart all filthiness and superfluity of naughtiness, and receive with meekness the engrafted word which is able to save your souls. But be you doers of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. For if any be a hearer of the word and not a doer, he's like a man beholding his natural face in a glass. For he is beholding himself and goes his way and straightway forgets what manner of man he was. But whoso is looking into the perfect law of liberty and is continuing therein, he being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deed. We kind of talked about that a couple slides ago, right? About doing. Don't deceive ourselves. Sin is a deceiver. The devil's a deceiver. Your flesh is a deceiver. Don't believe the heart. It's desperately wicked. Right? But train your heart. Put, put, put God there. And where your heart is, that's your treasure. Right? Be a doer, not just a hearer. Oh, I know I should. How many times have any of you heard that in counseling? Well, I know I should do this, but... Mm, no but. Right? If you know you should do that, then do that. You're empowered to do it. What you're really saying is, I don't really want to do that. What do you got to say, God? La, 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 what? That's not the way we're supposed to be, right? You know, we have to be active. We need to be ready to perform like a, a, a good soldier at the word of his commander to perform what is told us, Okay? Psalm 119, someone's favorite psalm in verse 103, says, How sweet are thy words to my taste, yea, sweeter than honey to my mouth. Through thy precepts I get understanding, therefore I hate every false way. Thy words a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. I have sworn and I will perform it, that I will keep thy righteous judgments. Hmm. It was sweet to eat. It sounded good. I got an understanding from it. Yeah, okay, I get that. I believe that. But it meant nothing unless I perform it. <coughs> Same thing as what you read in James. Be a doer, not a hearer only. Back into James. Or no, this is First John. First John. Putting the active and proactive. This, 1 John 3, 14 through 18, we know that we have from death unto life because we love the brethren. That's being active. That love is an action verb, right? He that is loving not his brother is abiding in death. You like that guy? Well, yeah, kind of. Mm -hmm. That's not loving him. 
Okay? Whosoever is hating his brother is a murderer, and you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. Hereby perceive we the love of God, because he laid down his life for us. And so we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. But whoso has this world's goods, and sees his brother have need, and shuts up his bowels of compassion from him, how dwells the love of God in him? My little children, let us not love in word, neither in tongue, we should love in word and in tongue, but also in deed and truth, because the words would be empty otherwise. That would be vain. So be true to that word. Love in word and in deed. If somebody, if you can help somebody with whatever God has given you, be it knowledge, finance, um, location, there's a lot of other things that could apply into this, then you're a servant. And you are a steward of what God has given you. Yours isn't to hoard that. It is to share that. And, and when we start to make excuses, well, if I do this, what if they do this with it? That's not your concern, steward. I, I said, be go, do good with it. You do good with it. I'm not telling you to make sure they do good with it. Well, then I'm not being a good steward. Well, yeah, you're making excuses again. To not be good. And to not do good with what he gives you. See that? We do that. That's our yeah, our flesh does that. It is Korban, right? Yeah, absolutely. Love is what it's about. I mean, God is love and, and the fruit of the spirit is is the complete picture of love in all its actions. Let's be active here. You're all active in this a little bit today. Hebrews 10, 24 and 25, let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another and so much the more as you see the day approaching. What day? Day of his return, right? Judgment. Let us consider one another to provoke to love and good works. Part of our function as the body is to encourage and promote one another to love and good works. Right? Not just better Bible knowledge so I can win a Bible trivia game. That's, I mean, that's, that's all well and good, but that's not what it's about. It's about application of the core principles of what you've learned. As John 15, verse 12-14 through 14 says, This is my commandment, that you love one another, as I have loved you. How, is he, how did he love you? While you were yet a sinner, he sent Christ to die for you. Okay, so that takes away pretty much every excuse you have not to love somebody, doesn't it? Not pretty much, yes. All, it takes away all your excuses. Alright? There's something to pray about and to meditate upon. Alright? It's hard to have something against anyone when you're remembering yourself at the foot of the, the Savior's feet. Right? At the cross. Greater love has no man than this, than a man lay down his life for his friends. And you're my friends if you do whatsoever I command you. He commands us to love one another. That's not a small thing. But it is an easy thing if you remain at the foot of the cross. It really is. It really is. Because how could you be lifted up? How could you say no? Don't I don't forgive that or no? I don't like that person because they do this. When he loved you, when you drove those nails into his hands, so to speak. When you stay there, that's a humble place, sweetly broken, right? Holy surrender. We have to be active. First Peter 1, 22-23, Seeing you have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the Spirit to unfeigned love of the brethren. Boy, we see a theme here, don't we? See that you love one another with a pure heart fervently, being born again or begotten, 
not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by the word of God, which is living and abiding forever. And 1 Peter 2, 1-3, through 3, Wherefore, laying aside all malice, all guile, hypocrisies, envies, and all evil speakings, as newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word, that you may grow thereby, if so be you have tasted that the Lord is gracious. Have you tasted the Lord is gracious? All right, then lay aside all your malice, all your hate, all your hypocrisies, all your guile, all your envies, all your evil speakings. There's the action. That's, I highlighted the yellow there for uh, laying aside and desire. Those are the actions. Lay aside all that other stuff, put off, put on, and desire the sincere milk of the word so you could grow. Right? We're to be active in purifying our souls. In what? Obeying the truth through the Spirit. So through His Spirit, He gives you the ability to understand that truth and then to act on it in unfeigned love to the brethren. And He wants us to do it with a fervency. Not just a, well, He says i got to do it, so all right, I guess I love you. Right? A fervency. Did he love you with a fervency? Does he love you with a fervency? Does he plan on loving you through all eternity with a fervency? And we're supposed to be like him, so. Right? Let's keep putting this active in the proactive. So lastly, he that says, I know him and is keeping not his commandments is a liar and the truth is not in him. But whoso is keeping his word in him verily or truly is the love of God perfected. That's the end all be all. And hereby know we that we are in him. He that is saying he's abiding in him ought to himself also walk even as he walked. Does that mean you have to go to Jerusalem and put on sandals and a robe and walk? No, that's not what it's talking about. Yes. Right? Walk as he walked in complete love of the brethren. Greater love has no man than this, that he laid down his life for his friends. Did Jesus do that? Yes, he did. The love of God was perfected in Jesus Christ. And he showed that to us. And he dwells in you if you have his spirit. Let that love grow and come out. The spirit will produce the fruit. Again, it's not the, the fruit of any one of us. It is the fruit of the spirit that abides in you. We just got to stop doing the things that um, quench the Spirit. Another habit, but number two, begin with the end in mind. So, in the Covey book, they want you to develop a personal mission statement, right? What do I do? You know, what do I want to do? What do I want to accomplish? Well, I want to be with Jesus in the kingdom. Right? I want to be Christ-like. That could be your mission say statement, right? Or, I am a child of the one true king. That could be your mission statement, right? It's remembering who you are and your identity and, and what's coming, right? Let's read Isaiah 46, 8 through 10. Remember this and show yourselves men. Bring it again to mind, O you transgressors. Remember the former things of old, for I am God and there is none else. I am God and there is none else like me, declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times the things that are not yet done, saying, My counsel shall stand and I will do all my pleasure. His counsel will stand and he's told us what happens at the end. And we should be looking towards those things. And that will give us the strength to continue on. Because we know his word doesn't fail. And he's pronounced the end from the beginning. Begin with that end in mind. Let's look at a few things. John 3, 1 through 3. Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons of God. That's the end that's in mind, right? Therefore, you already are sons and daughters, by the way, but there's a future fulfillment of that. The whole creation is groaning, waiting for the manifestation of the sons of God. It says, therefore, the world knows us not because it knew him not. Beloved, now are we the sons of God, but it not yet, does not yet appear what we shall be. But we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him. 
for we shall see him as he is. And every man that has this hope in him is purifying himself even as he is pure. Notice we're, all, we're back into habit number one also of being proactive, purif purifying ourselves. How do you do that? Well, it's through the Spirit. It's not through works of the flesh. Right? Letting the potter have complete control over you, the clay. The end in mind. Revelation 21, 1 through 4. I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God, out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them, and will be their God. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow, nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. That's a beautiful end, isn't it? He knows the plans He has for us, and they are plans for good, for our prosperity. And there it is. So these are some things that if you keep in mind, it helps keep you walking on that path. It's like having a, a, a geo map to get where you need to go. Continuing, Revelation 21, verse uh, 5. And he that sat upon the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said to me, Write, uh, write for these words are true and faithful. And he said to me, It is done. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give unto him that is a thirst of the fountain of the water of life freely. He that is overcoming shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he shall be my son. But the fearful, the unbelieving, the abominable, the murderers, the whoremongers, sorcerers, and idolaters, and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. I don't think that second part should be what drives you. It should be that first part. The promises that he has for us. right? Perfect love casts out that fear. When you're, in, when you're walking in his love... You don't belong in that second group anymore. Now that second group is real. Begin with that end in mind too. Because that's going to help you preach the gospel and save those, some of those, right? And God wants all to be saved. But well, we know they won't. Brought us a way that leads to destruction. Keep that end in mind. Letters to the church is Revelation 2, verse 25. But that which you have already, hold fast till I come. And he that is overcoming and is keeping my works unto the end, to him will I give power over the nations. And he shall rule them with a rod of iron as the vessels of a potter. They shall be broken to shivers even as I received of my Father. Even to the end, the message is that we be overcoming and keeping his works. Right? Keep that end in mind. It's not going to be different. He expects the same from us now. If you don't like the things of God now, you're not going to like the kingdom, right? Don't think that all of a sudden, now, now I'm going to be drawn to God because now this part's gone. No, if you're enamored with this world more than Him and the world to come, something's not right in there. Okay? 1 Thessalonians 3, 11-13 now God himself and our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ direct our way unto you, and the Lord make you to increase and abound in love towards one another, toward all men, even as we do towards you, to the end that he may establish your hearts unblameable in holiness before God, even our Father, at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ with all his saints. That's the end you're, you're thinking of and working towards, right? Purifying yourself towards that end. But this is the end he's promised his saints, right? that your heart be established unblameable in holiness. So should you be unblameable in holiness now? Will you use the argument, but we all sin, so you can continue in that? No, it's a reality. You may sin again. You may. You don't have to. If you walk in the Spirit, you won't fulfill the lust of the flesh, says the Word of God, not the Word of Ken. But, if you do, short path to be recovered again 
your knees to the ground. Lord, how often should I forgive my brother? Till 70 times 7. He has great patience with us for our sake, brethren. Don't grow weary. As long as it's in your heart to repent, he will forgive. It's when you, 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 your heart's grown so callous from not caring about that stuff that then when you try, it's going to be too late. But he wants us to establish our hearts unblameable by, again, above that. The Lord make you to increase and abound in love one towards another and towards all men. Be careful, too, that we don't, in that is, that it is to all men. Right? And you can get into the argument about God loved Jacob, Esau, he hated. All right, well, he still wants all men to come to salvation. He hates their works because he knows in the end what it does for them. But he commands us to love everyone. All right? So that we could be perfect and unblameable. Be careful we don't justify ourselves to have a reason to hate somebody else or to not love them in our hearts. That's a tall order. You can't fulfill it, but God can fulfill it in you. These are some of the things we can direct our prayers to, right? If we think of the end and how we are to be, let's be that now. Be who you are in Christ. And uh, one more for habit two, beginning with the end in mind. But Revelation 22, 12, And behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with me to give every man according to his work shall be. He's coming pretty quick. Are you ready for your reward? What will be your reward? Are you walking now with that reward in mind? Well done, good and faithful servant. Be that good and faithful servant now. Or you won't hear that in the end. Make sense? Capiche? <laughs> Habit number three, per put first things first. So spend time doing what fits into our divine mission. Or as the Israelites would understand, let the Ark of the Covenant be in front of you always. All the time, put God first in all things. And that's how you are an effective saint. Mark 12, 29-34, Jesus answered him and said, The first of all the commandments is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one, Lord. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, and with all your strength. This is the first commandment. Right? And it's repeated by the scribe afterwards as well. And he adds that it's, it's worth more than all the whole burnt offerings and sacrifices. Do we love God first? Or is he an add-on? Do we love what he does for us in our lives more than we love him? Right? Sometimes we could be, oh, I love you, but we really remain... I love what you do for me and how you make me feel. What is love? Love is a sacrificial love, right? Expecting nothing in return. We'll get to that too, so I won't belabor that at the moment. Exodus 20, verses 2 and 3, I am the Lord your God, which has brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. You shall have no other gods before me. Same premise. I know the word does, says this, but mm, that's other God. Whatever that is, that's another God. Right? Revelation 22, 12 through 14 tells us he is the Alpha, the beginning. He is the first as well as the last. Put him first in all things. If you kept that one commandment, put God first. You're not transgressing any commandment because you'll be putting him first in all things. Just that one commandment. Revelation 20, verse 
4 through 6. And I saw thrones, and they that sat upon them, and judgment was given unto them. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God, which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads or in their hands. And they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. But the rest of the dead lived not again until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is he that has part in the first resurrection. On such the second death has no power, but they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. That's another first thing to put first. To be in that resurrection. To be blessed and holy and death have no power on you. You begin with that end in mind, you're going to conduct yourself differently while you're walking in the flesh. Because you're not going to walk in the flesh, you're going to walk in the spirit while having flesh. Habit four is to think win-win. Um, when we think win-win, we reduce our chances of holding on to our own interests. We reduce our possibility of being selfish instead of just I win, and I don't care if you lose, right? Philippians uh, two four for your notes tells us to look on things of others, but. When I think win-win, it may start to look, start out looking as today's loss is tomorrow's win. And a couple of verses for that. And ultimately, I believe these are win-wins. But it may appear as a loss. Philippians 3, 7 and 8, But what things were gained to me, those I counted loss for Christ. Yea, doubtless, and I can count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dung, that I may win Christ. He put everything in perspective. He, he lost all that stuff, so it felt bad for him, right? But was that really a loss for him? No, it was a win for him. And certainly a win for the kingdom. The win-win process basically has four steps when you look at it. See the problem from the other point of view in terms of the needs and concerns of other parties. God's point of view and then the sinner's point of view. If you look just from the sinner's point of view, you're not going to get the whole picture. You need to think of God's point of view as otherwise you're not going to end up in a win situation. Identify the key issues and concerns that are involved in the equation. And uh, these are the exact things that Covey uses. I'm putting in all the other words in here from your scriptures I think they match up perfectly determine what results would make a fully acceptable solution well your holiness and eternal life that would be a perfectly acceptable solution that's a win for you and a win for Jesus right and a win for the kingdom win for the father right win for those others who love you right and then identify the only option to achieve those results which is Christ he's the only way to trust and obey him so think about that win-win and that today's loss is tomorrow's win if it's for the kingdom, right? You lay down your life, right? We're gonna, we have a couple of passages that kind of apply to that here. John 12, 24, 25, Verily, verily, I say unto you, except a grain of wheat fall to the ground and it die, it is abiding alone. But if it dies, it will bring forth much fruit. He that loves his life shall lose it, and he that is hating his life in this world shall keep it unto life eternal. They had to have a loss to really have the gain and the win. The good news. We see an example of that in Joseph. Genesis 50, verse 20. But for you, talking to his brethren... You thought evil against me, but God meant it on for unto good well, when they you know, sold him off, right? And he ended up the head of Egypt. Why? To bring to pass as it is this day, to save much people alive. What you have given up in this life, your loss, is a win for you. And it's also a win for other people if you're walking in Christ because you're going to tell them about that same experience and they're going to have that same opportunity to repent, right? And they have that win as well. What well, looks like a loss. You know, the people of the world may think you're losers. They may think you're losing right now. But you're not. You know you're not. 
But you could see how they could think that. Which brings us to Ezekiel, chapter 3. <laughs> Smaller font. Don't worry, I'll read it to you. <laughs> Son of man, I have made you a watchman under the house of Israel. Therefore, hear the word at my mouth and give them warning from me when I say to the... Wait. Hear the word from whose mouth? God's mouth. Right? God is giving a warning. You are just the mouthpiece. You're supposed to do it for him. He says, you do it. You're supposed to do it. So give them a warning from me. If you're not giving the warning, we're not being obedient. Okay? When I say to the wicked, you shall surely die, and you give him not the warning, nor speak to warn the wicked from his wicked ways to save his life, the same wicked man shall die in his iniquity, but his blood I will require at your hand. God wants us to tell the wicked so that they are, their lives can be saved. They will have a loss, but it's going to be a gain for them. They're going to have a loss, but it's going to be a win. They'll be flying the W because they will have that opportunity to repent. Right? Win Christ. Yet, if you warn the wicked, and he turns not from his wickedness nor his wicked way, he shall die in his iniquity, but you've delivered your soul. So you've got to win anyway, because you were obedient. Again, when a righteous man does turn from his righteousness and commit iniquity, and I lay a stumbling block before him, he shall die. People might argue, oh, look, God's not put a stumbling block. He's, he, no, he's giving them over to their heart's desire. God does that. God is in no way at fault. They committed iniquity. But because you have not given him a warning, he shall die in his sin, and his righteousness which he has done shall not be remembered. But his blood I will require at your hand. What does that mean? I don't know. Is he going to require you to take that life? Nevertheless, if you warn the righteous man, and that the righteous sin not, and he does not sin, he shall surely live because he's warned and you've delivered your soul. Right? It's a win-win program to proclaim the gospel for the repentant sinner and for you. And again, for the kingdom. Matthew 16, 24 through 27, Jesus said to his disciples, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself a loss, take up his cross. What does that mean? Take up your cross. Oh, people make fun of me for keeping the Sabbath? No. Take up your cross. That's the instrument of death, and you are willingly walking and following Christ on the same path. Okay? Lay down your life. Exactly what it says. Yes. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it, and whosoever will lose his life for my sake shall find it. For what is a man profited if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? For the Son of Man shall come in the glory of his Father with his angels, and then he shall reward every man according to his works. Again, what's a loss, appears as a loss today, could be a win in the kingdom. So do think win-win, but put it in perspective. What looks like a loss for you may not be a loss. Anything that's taken away from your flesh is good. Anything that helps you walk in the Spirit is a win. Looked like a loss. Jesus Christ, absolutely. You think his disciples thought that was a loss? They sure did. They were pretty despondent. Oh, man, we thought he was going to restore the kingdom of Israel, and now he died. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Patience, grasshopper. Huh? It was a win for all of us. Amen. And thanks, Brother Ron. Excellent. Habit number five, seek first to understand and then to be understood. That's in Covey's book. We'll look at the biblical example of that. Okay. Covey presents this habit as the most important of interpersonal relations. Right? Effective listening is important. God gave us two ears and one mouth so we would listen twice as much as we speak. Psalm 53, 2. God looked down from heaven upon the children of men to see if there were any that did understand, that did seek God. Proverbs 3, 5 through 6 says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart, because the heart's desperately wicked. Be careful. 
Lean not to your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct your paths. Learn it, then live it, then teach it. That's going to be our mantra through this piece. Learn it, then live it, and then teach it. First, seek to understand. Learn it. Proverbs 2, 1 through 6. My son, if you will receive my words and hide my commandments with you, so that you incline your ear to wisdom and apply your heart to understanding. Yea, if you cry out after knowledge and lift up your voice for understanding, if you seek her as silver and search for her as hidden treasures, then you shall understand the fear of the Lord and find the knowledge of God. For the Lord is giving wisdom. Out of his mouth comes knowledge and understanding. If you're going to seek first to understand, you have to seek him in all things. He is the fount of all true wisdom and knowledge. And he gives it to us through his word as well. Psalm 111.10 says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and a good understanding have all they that do his commandments, hear and do. Right? This is the live it. Learn it, live it, teach it. This is the live it now. You've learned it from God, now you're living it. Psalm 119, verse 125, I am thy servant. Give me understanding that I may know your testimonies. And verse 169 of the same chapter, Let my cry come near before thee. O Lord, give me understanding according to thy word. Psalm 119. You learn it, you live it, and then you teach it. Hebrews 5, 12 through 14, For when the time comes, for when is the time you ought to be teachers? You have need that one teach you again that which be the first principles of the oracle of God and are become such as as need of milk and not strong meat. For everyone that's using milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. But strong meat is belonging to them that are of full age, even those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. You have to learn and understand and then you have to be living it. And that's how you can be teaching. And again, you avoid being a hypocrite if you can do those things. First seek to understand, then to be understood. Titus 2, verse 12 through 13 says, Teaching us, there's our being taught, denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live, this is our living it part, soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. You get a lot of people who will tell you different, brethren. Don't listen to them. They'll tell you, oh, you're never going to be able to live godly in this world. You're always going to be a sinner. You're always going to do this stuff, bad stuff. That's not what the Word tells us anywhere in the Scriptures. You will not find anywhere that says that lie of Satan. God has taught us that denying we should deny ungodliness and deny worldly lusts. And we should live soberly, righteously, and godly here in this present world. Learn it. Live it. And teach it. You won't be a hypocrite when you're talking about it if you're living it. Colossians 3, 16-17 says, Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another. Not just in Bible studies, but in psalms, in hymns, and spiritual songs. Singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. And whatsoever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by Him. Again, that ties together all the prayers and all the, the Scripture reading, all the principles we've talked about here today. Learn it. Live it. Teach it. Galatians 6, 6-9. through 9, Let him that is taught in the word communicate to him that is teaching in all good things. But be not deceived. God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man is sowing, that shall, he shall also reap. For he that sows to his flesh, of the flesh shall reap corruption. But he that sows to the Spirit, shall of the Spirit reap life everlasting. And let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. So, But there are going to be people who teach you today that you can sow to the flesh and you can still reap glory. They are lying to you. That is not what the book says. That is not what the Spirit says if you have a Spirit. The Spirit's going to deny that all day to you. But if you sow to the Spirit, you will reap life everlasting. 
Learn it. Live it. Teach it. Habit six, synergize. Not S-I-N. Synergize, synergize. Right? We're going to read through these passages on the screen. So you want to put them in your notes now. They're going to be on your next several slides. 1 Corinthians 12, 1 through thir verse 31. 1 Corinthians 13, 1 through 13, and Ephesians 4, 1 through 16. I'll repeat those again. 1 Corinthians 12, 1 through 31. 1 Corinthians 13, 1 through 13, and Ephesians 4, 1 through 16. Right? Through trustful communication, we find ways to leverage individual differences to create a whole that is greater than the sum of its parts. That's the body of Christ. And that's what we're going to read about. <laughs> that's 1 through 11. <laughs> this is on three slides. So I'll uh, read along with me. You can open up your Bible. It has bigger font. <laughs> this, this is important. This is important. So now concerning spiritual Spiritual gifts, brethren, I would not have you be ignorant. You know that you were Gentiles carried away unto these dumb idols, even as you were led. Wherefore, I give, to you understand, I give to you understand, or understanding, that no man speaking by the Spirit of God is calling Jesus accursed, and that no man can say that Jesus is the Lord but by the Holy Spirit. Now there are diversities, or differences, of gifts, but the same Spirit. And there are differences of administrations, but the same Lord. And there are diversities of operations, but it is the same God which is working all in all. But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to every man to profit with all. For to one is given by the Spirit the word of wisdom, to another the word of knowledge by the same Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit, to another the gifts of healing by the same Spirit, to another the working of miracles, to another prophecy, to another discerning of spirits, to another, diverse kinds of tongues. To another, the interpretation of tongues. But all of these working that one and self-same spirit, dividing to every man severally as he will. For as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of that one body being many are one body, so also is Christ. For by once we are all baptized into one body whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free, and have been made all, we have been all made to drink into one spirit. For the body is not one member, but many. If the foot shall say, because I am not the hand, am I not of the body? Is it therefore not the body? And if the ear shall say, because I am not the eye, I am not of the body? Is it then therefore not of the body? If the whole body were an eye, where would be the hearing? If the whole body were hearing, where would be the smelling? But now has God set the members, every one of them in the body, as it has pleased him. And if they were all one member, where were the body? But now they are many members, yet one body. And the eye can't say to the hand, I have no need of you, nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. Nay, much more, those members of the body which seem to be more feeble are necessary. And those members of the body which we think to be less honorable, upon these we bestow, bestow more abundant honor, and our uncomely parts have more abundant comeliness. For our comely parts have no need, but God has tempered the body together, having given more honor to that part which lacked, that there should be no schism in the body, but that the members should have the same care one for another. Just like the husband loved his wife like his own flesh, the care one for another. You are the same body. You should certainly care what happens to each and every one of the other members here and afar. And whether one member suffer, all the members suffer with it. Or one member be honored, all the members rejoice with it. Now you are the body of Christ and members in particular. And God has set some in the church, first apostles, secondarily prophets, thirdly teachers, after that miracles, then of gifts, healings, helps, governments, diversities of tongues, are all apostles, are all prophets, are all teachers, are all workers of miracles, have all the gift of healing, do all speak with tongues, do all interpret, 
but covet earnestly the best gifts. And yet show I unto you a more excellent way. All the parts of the body work in symphony together to play a beautiful melody. That's what the body of Christ is. And he shows us that excellent way. How do we have that care one for another? And he gives us a clue in all this. Just like, I mean, the members caring, you know, got, oh, I'm not the, a good part of the body. I must not be part of the body. No, all the parts of the body are one body. And we should have that care one for another. Again, the Ephesians example of, of Christ and the church and the husband and the wife should not go unnoticed. Right? To love each other as you love your own flesh. And he shows us that is the more excellent way. I have on your screen the KJV version, but I'm going to read from the NLT as I, as I turn through here. If I could speak all the languages of the earth and of angels, but didn't love others, it would only be a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. If I had the gift of prophecy, and if I understood all of God's secret plans and possessed all knowledge, and if I had such faith that I could move mountains but didn't love others, I would be nothing. If I gave everything I have to the poor and even sacrificed my body, I could boast about it, but if I didn't love others, I would have gained nothing. Love is patient and kind That's with one another. Love is not jealous or boastful or proud or rude. Love does not demand its own way. It's not irritable. It keeps no record of being wronged. Oh, remember when you did this to me? It doesn't keep those records. That's God's love for you, isn't it? Right? Continuing, he says, It does not rejoice about injustice, but rejoices whenever the truth wins out. Love never gives up, never loses faith. It's always hopeful and endures in every circumstance. Prophecy and speaking in unknown language and special knowledge will become useless, but love will last forever. Now our knowledge is partial and incomplete, and even the gift of prophecy reveals only part of the whole picture. But when the time of perfection comes, these partial things will become useless. When I was a child, I spoke and thought and reasoned as a child. But when I grew up, I put away childish things. Now we see things imperfectly like puzzling reflections in a mirror. But then we shall see everything with perfect clarity. All that I know now is partial and incomplete. But then I will know everything completely, just as God now knows me completely. Three things will last forever, faith, hope, and love. And the greatest of these is love. Whenever you're reading your KJV and you read that charity, throw love in there because that means so much more to us today than the word charity is. Charity is just giving, and that's sacrificial. That's a form of love indeed. But this is the kind of love that God expects each of us to have for one another. It's not just you and God. You can't say, I love God and not love your brother completely. Or your wife. Or your children. Or the stranger. Or your boss. Let us be perfect as He is perfect. Let us be holy as He is holy. Love conquers everything. Right? Love conquers all. Nothing else conquers all. Love. God is love. God conquers all. Indeed, and amen. And then Ephesians 4 through 16. Well, we've got the first nine verses on the screen. Paul writing says, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you that you walk worthy of the vocation wherewith you are called, with all lowliness and meekness, with long suffering, forbearing one another in love endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace, there's one body, one Spirit, even as you are called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. 
But unto every one of us grace is grace given according to the measure of the gift of Christ. Wherefore he saith, when he ascendeth up on high and led captivity captive and gave gifts to men, now that he ascended, what is it but that he also descended first to the lower parts of the earth? He that descended is the same also that ascended up far above all heavens that he might fulfill all things. And he gave some apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers. Why? For the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. Till we all come to the unity of the faith and to the knowledge of the Son of God, unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. That's how he wants us to be measured up today that we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro, carried about with every wind of doctrine, by the slight of men and cunning craftiness, whereby they lie and wait to deceive, but rather speaking the truth in love, we may grow up into him in all things, which is the head, even Christ, from whom the whole body jointly fit together and compacted by that which every joint is supplying according to the effectual working in the measure of every part, making increase of the body unto the edifying of itself into love. That's an effective believer. The body of Christ in unity, walking in love one to another. That's the synergy that we need. And then the last habit we're going to talk about today, sharpening the saw. Now, the way I'll tell it is going to be the axe. Jeremiah 51.20 says, You are my battle axe and weapons of war, for with you I will break in pieces the nations, and with you I will destroy the kingdoms. Right? Sharpening the saw or the axe. So here's how the story goes. A young man approaches a foreman of a logging crew, and he asks for a job. That depends, says the foreman. Let me see you fell this tree. So the young man stepped forward and skillfully fells the tree. The, impressed, the foreman says, okay, you can start Monday. Monday came, the new lumberjack outproduced all the seasoned veterans by 15%. Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, the same thing. The new man worked harder and harder each day. And the next Monday morning, the foreman approached the young man and said, you could pick up your paycheck on the way out today. Startled, the young man said, what? I thought you said we get paid on Friday. He says, normally we do, but we're letting you go today because you've fallen behind. Our daily felling charts show that you've dropped from first place on Monday to last place within a couple of days. But I'm a hard worker, the young man objected. I arrive first, I leave last. I didn't even work through my coffee breaks and on the weekend. How could others outproduce me? The foreman sensed the young man's integrity and thought for a minute and said, have you been sharpening your ax? The young man replied, no, sir. I've been working too hard to take time for that. Our lives are sometimes like that. Sometimes we get so busy we don't take time to sharpen the axe. In today's world, it seems everyone is busier, but less happy than ever. Why is that? Could it be that we've forgotten how to stay sharp? There's nothing wrong with activity and hard work. But God doesn't want us to get so busy that we neglect the truly important things in life, like taking time to pray to read and study your scripture, to listen to that still, small voice of God. And all the time we think, uh, all the time we need to relax, think and meditate, learn and grow is there for us if we'll take it. And if we don't take the time to sharpen the axe, we're going to become dull and we're going to lose our effectiveness, just like that young lumberjack did. Well, thank be to God, he was today the Sabbath day, huh? Right? Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. In it you shall not do any work, you nor your son nor your daughters nor your manservant nor your maidservant nor your cattle nor your strangers that's within your gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that in them is, and rested the seventh day. Wherefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. He didn't have to sharpen his axe, but we do. Right? And yet he, he actually sharpens it for you on this day. Right? He gives us his saints to fellowship together. He gives us his Sabbath day 
You know what? Leviticus 23, he gives us his feast days too. You're in the seventh month, the feast season. Right? It's coming up real soon. you got a week, right? Less than a week. Till uh, trumpets. The Lord said to Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel and say to them, Concerning the feasts of the Lord, you shall proclaim to be holy convocations. Even these are my feasts, he says. Isaiah 58, 13 and 14, If you turn your foot away from the Sabbath, from doing your pleasure on my holy day, and call the Sabbath a delight, the holy of the Lord, honorable, and shall honor him, not doing your own ways, nor finding your own pleasure, nor speaking your own words, then you shall delight yourself in the Lord. And I will cause you to ride upon the high places of the earth and feed you with the heritage of Jacob your father, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken it. Also for your notes, Mark 2, 27, 28, the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. Therefore, the Son of Man is also Lord of the Sabbath day. He gives us these times of rest and rejuvenation so that we can be sharp and go back. Don't you come away from the Sabbath rejuvenated, recharged, and ready for another week? And by the time the end of the week winds down, winds down, your axe is pretty dull, right? You, you can, I can't cut, I can't cut down any more trees, Lord. I thank God for, thank God for the Sabbath day. Thank you, Lord. I need this rest. You know I needed it. You provided for me. And then you're recharged through His Word and through prayer and through the fellowship of the saints, the one body loving one another as we're supposed to be doing, and we're all recharged to take on another week. That will beat you down mercilessly. <laughs> but you're not alone. You are with Him. And He with you. And through the Spirit, we're all together. Let us live that way. All right? Let's learn His ways. Let's live it. And then let's teach it to others. I got one more slide for you. Seven more habits for successful saints. Just one slide. You can recall these very easily. You can post them at your workstation, on your refrigerator, or in your Bible. These are things that will help enable you to continue in that walk. And you don't have to remember all those other slides I talked about. Okay. Except to love one another. But that's here too. Okay. Read and study your Bible regularly. It's a gift. Right? Don't judge one another over how often you read or what version you read or whatever that, right? If we're going to judge one another, let it be by the word on how well we're, we're observing it and then in love correct one another, okay? Let us pray daily and fellowship every week when we get the opportunity. And if you can't be near, get on the phone or get online and get that fellowship with someone else as well, right? Because they may need you just as much as you need them, right? Everybody needs to, to walk and share in that love, right? Worship with enthusiasm and with joy. Not like the Quakers. You smiled, you must have sinned, right? With joy, right? Come, concerning the common feast, that's the first time the Bible mentions rejoice is the Feast of Tabernacles. Rejoice. He always tells us that joy is a, a fruit of the Spirit, Right? And yet we see still a lot of somber-faced, judgmental Christians grumbling and complaining. Brethren, let's not do that. Let's worship with enthusiasm and joy and give cheerfully and think frequently. All that goes together. Let's live righteously through the Spirit. Bear godly fruit. Right? It's not that you keep the Sabbath and the holy days and refrain from eating pork or this or that. It's that you're producing the fruit of the Spirit. Because guess what? The Jews who don't have Christ do those other things and they don't have salvation. Okay? Walk in the Spirit. Walk humbly with your God. Show mercy and judgment properly. And love, holy. You can also change that to H-O-L-Y. Love, holy. One another, because if you can't do it to one another, just one of you, if you, can, if you can just not love one other person, your love of God is not right. 
Don't kid yourself. I'm not saying you agree with everything the other person does. By the Word of God, if you love them, you're going to show them the right way. And you're not going to be judgmental because you were once an unforgiven enemy of Christ as well. Love holy and show mercy. In the, in the tabernacle, in the Holy of Holies, we had the tablets of the law, but the mercy seat was always over the top of it. Because it's because of that law that we need the mercy. So let us not forget our humble beginnings. And let's not forget our first love. And then remember Luke 17.10. Likewise, when you have done all those things which are commanded you, say we're unprofitable servants. We have done that which is just our duty to do. And I hope you found something of edification from this today. That's all we have for the slides. I'll ask Brother Ron to come up and uh, lead us in hymns. And a